Bukaw ang atis Uh, you've got the double 
things. So there are ways of taking out your environment to test a bit that you want to have more control. And uh, what logic can be quite useful in a lot of stories as well, because you can remove some of the weaknesses. Right, OK. All right, next one. Number eight. Right. And then that's the Yeah, OK. So, so this is the obvious one. I don't know what exactly it is. Uh, but I don't think this is like, oh, I do know when this happened. Right? And so uh, what exactly it is when you get over the test, so you go to the laws and it just has failed. Right? We, had, we, we had this problem where we had these, uh, these tests where they did some complicated multi-process thing and something would tie down. And so you get this. So now we have a huge debugging problem. So the, uh, the lesson here, the recommendation here, is to pay attention to what information is going into your test logs and provide as much diagnostic information as you possibly can. Now, so for most Java tests, especially, especially unit tests, this is pretty good because when you, when you say a cert true or 30 equals or something like that, you get an exception stack trace, and usually the position of that, the exact, exact line in which the test failed, and usually it's good for context, will fail. And, and so most of the time, that's not a problem. And it's the uncommon cases that get you, right? So in that case, the usual problem is exception is thrown that indicates test failure or depending on how you classify it, a test error. And so again, the stack trace is you right at the place that it failed. Great. It's all information. There's an uncommon case, for instance, which is you want to test that an exception of the proper type was thrown from the proper location. And it's a little too easy to say, oh, I'll, just put, I'll just use uh, like a JNN annotation, I'll put a try block around a bunch of stuff, and catch an exception and make sure that it was the right type. Uh, but the problem is that it's a little too easy to do that and accidentally catch exceptions that it originate from the wrong place. And in that case, what you have to do is you have to tear apart the test and figure out that in particular the case, suppose there's a case where somebody wants to, to make sure that the illegal argument exception is thrown. But there's a whole block of code. How do you know that the illegal argument exception was thrown from the right place, the one that you're expecting, instead of saying maybe something was, went wrong with your setup code, also true illegal argument exception. So um, anyway, so there are cases like that that come up where if you have a failure, sure that you know, sometimes, sometimes it's not so simple as just saying it's or equals. Sometimes you have to go through a fairly complicated algorithm and then, ah, OK, yes, I'm going to explicitly signal failure here. And when you do that, make sure that you write down enough information to say how you got there. So see what your experience with this. This is where I was screaming in the dark. So I have, you got this, I mean, this is just terrific. So I think you have time to go. Oh, and a very long time ago. Very, very long time. Yeah, you know, the pieces were written on it. The problem was around there, but it was, it's very, very sort of to the point. Uh, I was asked, there was a bug. And
a different way of approaching the problem. It's a little bit different from how we're going to look at programming paradigms uh, in the rest of the talk, and I think how people generally frame the idea of a programming paradigm today. But I think that this paper, despite being from 1979, the year after he won the award in 78, uh, is actually like really current and really relevant. And I, I love this, um, this quote from it. He says, I believe the best chance we have to improve the general practice of programming is to attend to our paradigms. So he really frames paradigms as being central to the entire discipline of programming, not the language, not the algorithm, but the paradigm as being something that we should really focus on. And that's why we're talking about it right now. So my hope in this talk is that we, uh, we just pay some attention to the paradigms that we use, the paradigms that we know, the paradigms that we don't know so well. And uh, we're going to do some things that we're going to do take a look at how they affect the code we write when we think about our code. And hopefully, hopefully, we'll have a little bit more motivation to attending to our paradigms. So this, of course, brings up the question, what are we talking about? I've used the word paradigm like 80,000 times already at a building in the Bible talk. What is it? What is a paradigm? So as I said, I study philosophy. And uh, when I first ran into the word paradigm, really big word, uh, it was in the philosophy of science class where we read a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolution by Thomas Kuhn. Anybody read it? Couple hands, couple hands. Okay, cool. So, um, Thomas Kuhn is basically like a historian of science, and at least in this book, uh, he is kind of trying to give an account of how we make scientific progress as kind of a collective of a civilization. And he centers the whole dialogue and his whole way of thinking about scientific progress around the notion of a paradigm. And the way he kind of puts forward a paradigm, one way of understanding it is that it's sort of like a worldview, a way of looking at the universe, the world around us. And if we're talking about it from a scientific perspective, it's a view of the world of, of the discipline that we're in as scientists. So if you're uh, an astrophysicist, the universe is probably like the literal universe. And if you're maybe, I don't know, in the medical field, perhaps the world that you care about is the world of the human body, or perhaps populations of humans. Um, as computer scientists, of course, the world that we think is going to be computers and the programs that we want on them. So it's a way of understanding a whole domain. And another way of thinking about it is, is that kind of a model of that universe. A representation, a kind of symbolic uh, shorthand for understanding how that universe ticks, what makes it work. And if it's a model, then of course that brings up a, a classic quote from a statistician, George Box, who said that all models are wrong. So it's important to keep in mind that paradigm, this view of the world, view of the universe, is just an approximation. It is not how things actually work. It's just a model of how things work that helps us understand uh, and helps us do science to better understand the world around us. And so uh, Kuhn says that this model, this paradigm, isn't just telling us what's in the air. Standards of a science together in an inextricable mixture. So these three things, theory, methods, and standards, all come out of the paradigm. Um, what do we mean by that? Well, in theory, we mean what the universe is, what entities it's made up of, and how those entities behave and interact with each other. So what kind of system we're dealing with. And that's kind of what we would more typically think of when we look at a model. We see kind of what it tells us about the entities uh, in the domain that it's trying to describe. But the other important thing that Kuhn noted that kind of follows along or sort of falls out from that model is what it means to make scientific progress. What methods we should use to try and understand things better. Another way to understand that is like which questions we should ask, which questions even make sense to ask, or which questions are important to ask, which, again, we can understand is asking which problems are worth solving, which problems we should be focusing our attention on. And the standards by which we judge the quality of our work are also wrapped up in that. So this is kind of saying, okay, if we're figuring out in the methods what questions we should ask, in the standards we have an idea of what answers are good answers. And uh, in this case, what solutions to the problems that we framed would qualify as good solutions. So all of this, the entire like act of doing science, he says, is wrapped up in a paradigm. And in that sense, a paradigm, according to Kuhn, is necessary for scientific progress. It basically enables us to make progress. Um, so the way he describes it is he talks about kind of a pre-paradigm dark age. It's like nothing is getting done. There's maybe uh, someone over here who's got their own elemental model of the universe and is doing their own experiments, but they have completely no interaction with this other person over here who's got a different model, is asking different questions, getting different answers, and we're all just kind of circling around in the world. And it's impressive that the community is not really getting anywhere. Until a paradigm comes along that everyone in the community can, for whatever reason, or decides to rally behind and get on board with. And that theory, those methods, those standards, allow us as a whole to collectively make work and advance our understanding of the universe in this model, in this paradigm. So, for example, um, time of the Ptolemaic, geocentric view of the cosmos, where the Earth is like this warm, white, shining center of the entire universe, and all of the celestial bodies that we can see in the sky live all around us, quite literally, in these celestial spheres. This is an, an example of a paradign where it's a model, we know now that the model is wrong, but having this model enables astronomers to uh, reach some kind of consensus and, and collaborate together to make advances in their observations and give a structure to their work that allowed us to make some kind of progress on understanding the universe around us. But of course, as we just mentioned, this model is wrong. So there are going to be anomalies, there are going to be observations that scientists make while carrying out that progress that don't fit in the model. And what ends up happening is that first we try to shoehorn them in, and you say, like, okay, yeah, I noticed that Mars is going backwards, but uh, that totally makes sense if we have, like, crazy episode goals, like, orbits around orbits, and, yeah, we can just keep adding circles until everything works out. And so this is what ends up happening. These anomalies, at first, they, they kind of get crammed into the model that they that don't quite fit well in, uh, but as enough of them accumulate, eventually they can no longer be ignored, and the community is sort of going into a state of crisis, where uh, maybe, you know, the, the, the Earth guy is like, no, this paradigm is correct, it is the final answer to everything that we know about the universe, and we will keep adding episode goals, we will keep adding complicated mechanisms to explain the anomalies as long as we need to, until everything is solved. And other people are saying, no, we can't keep holding to our old ideas, we need this new paradigm. So we have this new paradigm, this other new paradigm. Blah, 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 there's just argument and chaos, and progress has kind of stopped at this point, we're all just arguing with each other.
and I'll wait. And he plays like this comes out. Another shift happens, and so on and so forth forever, basically. It just continues in this cycle. He says. And so this is yeah, this is the idea of paradigms and how they enable progress and what they what they do for science according to Bakunian view of things. But okay, there's been a lot of me like yapping about science and <laughs> outdated astronomical models that we know don't work. So we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about programming. So let's get deep. What is it? What is programming? What are we doing? What are programs? What are computers? Why are we even here? What are we talking about? And this is kind of the answer that different programming paradigms, sorry, the question that different programming paradigms give us sort of different answers to. They give us different models of the world of programming. So um, if we think about the dark ages before computers, before when, when like computers were like humans, like actual humans sitting down and doing computations and like, looking up logarithms and like books and stuff, like this is a really dark age, right? None of us want to think about it. It's terrible. And then the miracle happens. Humans collectively as a civilization somehow figured out how to like electrocute a pile of rocks and make it do whatever we say, which is pretty awesome, and gave us all jobs ultimately. Um, and this led to kind of this new paradigm, imperative programming, where we give the computer commands. So the idea is that programming is like telling the computer to do stuff. Imperatives, do this, do that, follow my commands. I follow them in the order I give them, do this and then do that, and then do that everything. So in the imperative programming, we have this notion of like time being important, state, values changing. And we tell the computer to like, remember these values, like put these values in your boxes in your brain, and remember them and change them in ways that I ask you to, and then tell me what they are later. And so this command giving is kind of what the act of programming becomes in this paradigm. And I think it's helpful to have like visual mental models of things, because I'm a very visual learner. Um, and as I said, also, ex philosophy student, so I like to have like meta, like models of models of models. And I think a useful metaphor, kind of visual metaphor for imperative programming is uh, a complex machine, like a, like a clock or a watch. Um, because imperative programming sort of forces us to focus on the nitty gritty, on like the intricate details of putting together a complex system, a complex machine that, that gives us the intended action, whether that's like turning hands on a clock. I think clocks are a good metaphor also because of the time uh, notion in imperative programming state. But of course, like a clock, these intricate machines, that means we have to pay very, very close attention and we have to be very precise about each individual component, each little, on each little cog in the machine. And if we mess up somewhere, or if uh, we don't maintain the machine very well, and it, it, it starts to corrode, and it stops doing what we want, things stop working, we don't get, uh, we don't get the computer to do what we say. So this could be considered a type of anomaly or something that this paradigm doesn't handle very well. And so other paradigms came along that aims to have a solution, a type of problem which is harder than a programming. So for example, object-oriented programming says, okay, this is too complicated once we try to create a really big Still watches it works okay, but if we try to make them really complex, there's too much going on. There's too many moving things. Keeping all of that state, all of those changing values all the time in, uh, in our programs, keeping all that straight is too hard. So let's divide it up into little chunks, which we call objects. And each little chunk will say, okay, you, uh, you keep a little part of the state of the program to yourself. That'll just be your responsibility. Just hide it from the rest of us, hide it from the rest of the object, keep it to yourself. And then what we'll do is uh, the rest of the program will send messages to you. So receive those messages, listen to them, watch, keep your eyes out for them. And when you get those messages, like depending on what state you have and what you know how to do, respond to them as you will. Now, uh, I don't know about you, this is a little bit different of an idea of a way of thinking about object-oriented programming than what I was taught when I first learned object-oriented programming. I was taught it was all about collectors and inheriting and like different types of memos and these complicated taxonomies and you and the whole diagrams and like, wow. But uh, we're going to come back to this a little bit later, but I think that the actually, the, the a better way of conceiving of this is uh, the way that people like Alan Kay, one of the founding fathers of the program uh, paradigm, um, talk about it when he talks about the early days of uh, smartphones and things like that. And this is, this is based on this idea of hiding things in little chunks and sending messages back and forth. And so the visual metaphor with a model of a model that I think works for this uh, paradigm comes from Alan Kay, who was a biology major, and he gave us a really nice, uh, biological metaphor of cells in the body as being kind of like an object-oriented program. The idea being that each object is kind of like a little cell, which has its own little state, like it's big and it's a little like a function, like whatever else is in a cell, I don't know biology, but, um, and it messages back and forth, chemical messages, by passing molecules across their membranes. So uh, a cell will receive a molecule, a particular receptor, will pick up molecules, pick up receptors, and it will send out other molecules, and from that, these concepts of like data cells, having our responsibilities, and sending messages, we get a nice, calm system that's no longer as rigid as our mechanical imperative watch. It's flexible, it's more, uh, more resilient, we don't have to worry about losing an individual cell, things like that. So this is, on one hand, a way we could consider object oriented programming as uh, model that's also the anomalies of imperative programming. But of course, it's not the only way of explaining some of those anomalies or getting rid of them. Um, another program like, another paradigm like functional programming might also have a good solution to some of those problems. So functional programming then takes the view, right, that, like, okay, this complex watch with all these big pieces, it's like a lot of mutable state, that's super dangerous because if we do one little thing wrong and one cog moves a little lever in a way that another cog wasn't expecting, then, like, everything goes away. So mutable state, bad idea, but pure functions, functions that just take inputs in and just return outputs out and do nothing else. Good place because they don't mess with any other parts of the program. So if we just look at our programs as being pure functions that just take data in and return data out, and we look at those functions as being made up of other functions that just take data in, put data out, and those are made up of other functions that data out, then we have a much safer program that uh, is sort of composed of, of smaller parts and is much easier to manage when we get to large levels of complexity. And so since this then has a very strong focus on data coming in and data going out, uh, you start in functional programming, you start thinking of your program as being like a pipeline, like transforming data from inputs to outputs. And I think a good visual metaphor for that is a yeah. pipeline. When you have kind of individual functions, sort of like individual stations on your site, you take in, you know, first one takes the raw material, some machine metals, and then the next one takes the pieces of cars, and then the next one takes the body of a car, and the next one takes the wheels, and so on and so forth until you get the desired output. And uh, this is a very different way of thinking about a program that has uh, a complex machine where you have to engineer every single little piece all to be working at exactly the same time together, or as a biological entity where sellers are cooperating with packages back and forth. Very different model. That explains uh, or solves some of the anomalies of the programming in another way, which I'll which we'll return to in a moment. Um, there's another programming paradigm that I want to talk about really quick, and that's uh, the broader paradigm, paradigm of declarative programming. So if imperative programming is like giving commands, right, like telling the computer to do this and then do that, telling the computer exactly how to do, declarative programming takes the view that maybe for some situations or some problems, that's a bit of an anomaly, like the fact that we have to be so focused on how we do everything. So declarative programming we could think of as saying, like, maybe that's not the best way of modeling the universe. In some cases, maybe it's better to just model the universe in terms of what I want and not how you go about getting it
people. It doesn't care how you do it. It doesn't matter if you uh, use pen or use pencil or how you make guesses or what order you enter the numbers in. It just matters that you do it. And at the end of the day, you've got a filled out quiz that meets all of the criteria. So anyway, this has not been meant to, to be like a, a, a you know, exhaustive tour of all the paradigms, basically. Just trying to, to think a little bit about how we can understand how we can, we can crystallize these models for ourselves. But these are just some examples. You know, by no means all the paradigms out there, and they're not even the principal paradigms. So this guy named Peter Van Roy made a chart that I think was intended for the screen. Um, <laughs> and it, it goes through and categorizes all the various principal programming paradigms as made up of different concepts and shows how the paradigms relate in terms of uh, adding to the concept here and there. And gives some examples of languages that support those paradigms. Um, and he, he writes, uh, he's got a lot of writings about, about these things. Uh, but this is, a, this is just to give you a sense of like how much we could spend time thinking and talking about programming paradigms. And um, one thing that I think that's interesting that you can see in this chart is that sometimes paradigms that we generally think of as being really diametrically opposed might actually not be that far apart. They might differ just by one or two concepts. And this brings me to another question. Like when we're looking at any given paradigm, how different are they really? I, when I started, as I said, I wasn't always in tech. And um, when I started getting into the programming community and I was exposed for the first time to these like epic battles between, you know, like different language proponents and different paradigm users. And you know, you've got like the functional programming people being like, ugh, OOP is so gross, like Java's for losers. And you've got the, the OOP people being like, whatever, half is gross, like, ew, what's all those weird symbols? Like, everyone's just, yeah, you're worse, no, you're the worst. Ah. Like, is this really necessary? What are we talking about here? What is the argument? So, if you with the paradigm of algebraic programming, functional programming, I started wondering, like, how different are they? And I think, in a certain light, we can actually see them as being really, really close. So, if embedded programming, if, if one of the potential anomalies of embedded programming is this idea of sharing the space between the purpose of the system, having to manage all the complexity of this intricate machine all at once and know exactly where everybody else is at every moment, if that's an anomaly, then it's recognized by both the algebraic data and the functional terms that both exist in modern human It's just that they do it in different ways. So, functional programming is like, well, if you just make it and you can't change state anymore, if it just isn't states, like, the values don't change over time, then you can share whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Because you won't be able to mess up like somebody else's part of the code over there. And object oriented programming just takes other approaches. Well, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with mutation as long as we protect it by keeping it in space in little units called objects and we don't share it between them. And so I think this is kind of interesting because, again, the, the, there's two different ways of looking at it, but the basic thing they're trying to do is the same. And I mentioned earlier that this is kind of different than what I learned about object oriented programming. So this is a quote from Alan Kay um, on a, I guess, now famous uh, mailing list message. He says he's sorry that he coined the term object. Thing that's very useful when you're trying to think like a computer. Because our poor little computers, they're sort of stuck in this paradigm. 
notice that the Erlang um, VM allows us to, to deal with to bring imperative code into our functional code. Because sometimes you just need to implement an algorithm imperatively. And especially if you're doing things like complicated math and you want to work. Keep trying to learn new paradigms, keep trying to invent. 